you all, and a uh, special thanks to Joanne Burke and Jane Murphy for the invitation to come back to speak with you all. I appreciate it very much. Normally, my presentations are accompanied with a PowerPoint slideshow, but I understood that we couldn't do that here this afternoon, so uh, I'll act out the slides as we go along. <laughs> Now last year, you remember last year, that you might have noticed a couple of articles in the Cape Cod Times regarding a sandwich homeowner's 37-year battle to replace wood shingles on her home with pollen. The articles noted that the house, which is 8 Grove Street in Sandwich, was built in 1693 and served as the Newcomb Tavern during the Revolutionary War period, was a haven for Tories, loyalists, and not rebels. It was not noted in any of those articles that the house was built in 1693, which just to place it, puts it right around the time of the sale of this trial, 1692-1693. And more to our point, the article did not note that that house was the birthplace of Bathsheba Ruggles. She will be the focus of my remarks here today. today. Um, the house, if, you, if we had the slides, you would see a slide of the house, which is obviously still there. But if you know where uh, the tea room is in Sandwich and the Congregational Church, if you stand there on that side of the, of the pond and look across it, the house is a large, obvious colonial house, and that's it. So very prominently placed in the center of Sandwich Village. Uh, Bathsheba was born there uh, February 13, 1746. She was the sixth child of the legendarily volatile marriage of Timothy Dwight Ruggles and Bathsheba born Newcomb Ruggles. A uh, few months before the American Revolution exploded in Lexington and Concord, 1775, a woman from West Barstow, a patriot with a kind of spiky personality named Mercy Otis Warren, uh, published a short play called The Group. This play was a satirical attack on loyalists slash Tories. One of the characters in the play most vividly and viciously attacked and ridiculed was the bloodthirsty character Brigadier Pete All. And in that play, he snarls such lines as, all our hope depends on brutal force, on quick destruction, misery, and death. Soon may we see dark ruin stalk, stalk around with murder, rapine, and inflicted pain. Now, one source observes that the play also attacks Brigadier Kate Ball's slatternly wife, Kate. And she is described in the play as nut brown cake, blithe buxom dowager, the jockey's prey. And uh, I assume that the term jockey here was used in the same sense as uh, Prince used it in a little red corvette. <laughs> Now, Mercios Warren knew these people, the people on whom his characters were based. They were Timothy and Bathsheba Ruggles. And neither their age nor their descent from Mayflower passengers immunized the Ruggleses from Mercy Otis Warren's attacks. Uh, they were both in their 70s at the time of this play. And Bathsheba Ruggles was directly descended from May Mayflower passengers, and she was also descended from Richard Thorne, a founder of Sandwich, and one of the main proponents of creating the town we are now in, the Reservation of Nashville. Now as for Timothy Ruggles, he became number three on a list of despised Massachusetts loyalists. He was officially exiled from Massachusetts on pain of death. He had been a Brigadier General in the French and Indian Wars. He was a judge, 
who had succeeded Mercy Otis Warren's father, James Otis Sr., as Speaker of the House of uh, Massachusetts House of Representatives. He was also a presiding officer at the Stamp Act Congress in 1765 when he refused to sign the Stamp Act protest. Uh, he was a vegetarian, very unusual in those days. There is a rumor that uh, during a uh, particularly prolonged argument that his wife uh, served up a dinner made from one of his dogs. Uh, that's probably not true since he was a vegetarian and wouldn't have eaten it anyway. He was a, a large, outsized man. He had an outsized confidence, which is usually described as conscious superiority. Now, the extended family had long owned in central Massachusetts about 100 square miles of property. And in 1753, uh, when Bathsheba was a child, about seven years old, her family moved from Sandwich to Hardwick. Anybody here from Hardwick? Anybody ever been to Hardwick? A couple of, oh, she's just putting her jacket on. One, okay. Uh, anybody ever heard of Hardwick? Uh, Rebels is fondly remembered in Hardwick as the creator of the Hardwick Fair, which is the oldest annual fair in the United States. Uh, this year it was, like many things, virtual. Anyway, the Ruggles moved his family there, and when he did so, it was very sparsely settled. Uh, now, of course, it's sparsely settled. Uh, the six children of this marriage went with Ruggles. Twenty-four related families actually went out to Central Mass. And Ruggles just had a ball. He lived as a country gentleman out there. He had a deer herd. He had foxhounds, horses, everything. His Tory notoriety, though, it was not helpful to Bathsheba's later trials. When Bathsheba, wish I had a picture of her, what actually what she was, what she's imagining looked like, nobody knows for sure. When she was 20, she got married in Brookfield. Maybe a name a little bit more familiar to those uh, central areas. Uh, Brookfield's about 14 miles from Hardwick. Hardwick's sort of a suburb of Brookfield. Uh, but by the time Bathsheba was 20 years old, she'd become a beautiful, irresistible, fiery, spirited, etc., etc., a woman along the lines of her mother. Uh, and she shared the highly confident spirit of her father. Bathsheba's husband was a guy named Joshua Spoon. <laughs> Uh, he was well off, but he was not in the same league as Bathsheba's father, Timothy. And the marriage, in fact, might have been arranged by Timothy. By all accounts, Joshua Spooner was a disagreeable personality. He was possibly a heavy drinker, not unusual in the 18th century. Uh, he was possibly abusive. He possibly had an affair with one or more of the female servants in the house. And uh, as a result of some or all of this, Bathsheba developed toward him what she later termed an utter aversion. Now, the leading treatise on the common law in the 18th century, which came to us in Britain, obviously, was a uh, group of volumes by a guy named William Blackston, and they're called the Commentaries on the Laws of England. He, now, as you probably know, uh, he describes the state of marriage in these volumes. It's a, a little different than it is now, and I'll quote from William Blackston. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. 
Now, you think, um, to me that was going to go over well. You, you think from that legal philosophy that divorce for women in the 18th century would be well nigh impossible. But it, it wasn't. And if the rumors about Joshua were true, Bathsheba would have ample grounds to seek divorce from him. But it wasn't easy. And one of the problems is that, or was, is that the party seeking the divorce had to prove not only, say, adultery, but had to prove herself blameless and beautiful. And that might have been a challenge for Bathsheba. And simple abandonment of the marriage was apparently not an option for her. In any event, by 1778, and we're in the middle of the American Revolution, after 12 years of married bliss slash misery, uh, the Spooners had three kids who had survived infancy. Elizabeth was 10, Joshua was 8, and Bathsheba was 3. Her name might have been Bathsheba, but it sometimes got converted into Bathsheba. Uh, they lived in uh, Brookfield with those kids and several servants in a comfortable two-story house very close to the Post Road, which is now East Main Street in Brookfield. It's gone. The house is gone. Um, and I have a lot of great pictures, though, of the well, which we will talk about soon, and the site of the house, and mostly it's poison ivy. So if you don't see those slides, you're not missing a whole lot. <laughs> now, at the time, and the well, by the way, is only a few feet from the road. Uh, at the time, Brookfield was the major town in the county. Uh, but Timothy, who we spoke about a moment ago, was long gone by 1778. He had left Massachusetts with British troops, uh, first went to New York. Uh, Bathsheba and her father were emotionally very close, and his departure from Massachusetts must have affected her deeply. Uh, but she didn't go, obviously, she stayed with her husband in Central Mass. Timothy eventually resumed his gentleman farmer role, uh, this time on 10,000 acres in Wilmot, Nova Scotia which were awarded to him by the British government. And among his accomplishments on that piece of property in Nova Scotia was his development of the yellow Bishop Pippin Abbott, which I wish I could have brought, but probably shouldn't in these days anyway. Now again, 1778, the Revolutionary War is uh, in full rage. Everything is very uncertain. There's a lot of upheaval. And again, the post road goes right in front of the Spooner house. And who knows who was passing down that post road at any given moment. That March, 1778, a 16-year-old Continental Army soldier named Ezra Ross was dragging, dragging himself by the Spooner house. Uh, he had probably left George Washington's encampment in Morristown, New Jersey which at that time was pretty much a petri dish of disease, uh, most notably smallpox, probably not COVID, but who knows. <laughs> uh, somehow, Ezra Ross made it the 200 miles, or close to 200 miles, to Brookfield. Now he's walking, of course. And he faced another 90 miles to get home. His family lived in Ipswich, a place called Blind Hill. Still, very bitter winter weather. Ezra Ross was taken into the Spooner home, went up the steps uh, from East Main Street. And by the way, the only thing that's really, well, the wellhead is still there, but there, there are two of the steps are still there. And the last time I was there, they were poison ivy free. But they're about the only thing around there that was. Um, anyway, they brought this young uh, teenage boy, really, into the house to be nursed back to health. And the teenage Ezra Ross and the 31-year-old Bathsheba Spooner, or Ruggles Spooner, 
formed what years later was described as a very warm relationship. Uh, to which I can only add. Now Ezra went on and he eventually uh, made it back to Ipswich. It wasn't long though before he was back in the army. Uh, troops were needed to defend the north. So he reappeared at the Spooner House in August uh, the following year to thank Bathsheba and I guess Joshua for past favors. Uh, as it were. Uh, and then he apparently fought at the pivotal, pivotal Revolutionary War battle of Ticonderoga. Also at that battle, in the red uniforms, were British Army Sergeant James Buchanan and Private William Brooks. After that battle and uh, several others that Ezra was involved in, now a seasoned 17 year old, he was back at the Spooner's house and he stayed on. Family friend, aide to Joshua, certainly Bathsheba's lover. It didn't take long for Bathsheba to try to convince Ezra to murder Joshua. Uh, her intention to eliminate Joshua from the picture might well have been spurred by her realizing that she had conceived in late January 1778. And the father was almost certainly Ezra. Uh, now besides the virtual impossibility of her getting divorced under those circumstances, she was probably also mindful of the punishment for adultery at least for women, which was painful and humiliating in the extreme. Public stripping to the waist, laying on of up to 30 lashes. Her original idea to get rid of Joshua was to have him poisoned. Now Ezra was uh, less than enthusiastic about murdering Joshua. Uh, the closest he came was the night before those two were going to journey to some property that Joshua owned in Princeton. Not the college. Anybody ever been to Princeton, Mass? Anybody from there? Princeton, look at that. People have been to Princeton, but not hardly. You say great restaurants? Great restaurants. Probably some of them date from this time. Um, anyway. That night, Ezra apparently spiked Joshua's broth, which was water diluted rum, with a substance called aqua fortis, which is essentially nitric acid. Joshua took a sip of that concoction and promptly spat it out. It had a very bitter taste, and he apparently observed if he had enemies in the house, he should think they intended to poison him. Ezra took the aqua fortis to Princeton, but he didn't try it again. And Bathsheba probably assumed that he wouldn't. In fact, though, Ezra went straight from Princeton back home to Ipswich. After British forces, commanded by Lieutenant General Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, surrendered at Saratoga in October of 1777, created thousands of British Army prisoners of war. And the problem with that is, what are they going to do with them? What is the Continental Army going to do with all these people? They barely can feed themselves. Some were imprisoned in internment camps. There was one in Charlestown, for instance. Uh, but many of them escaped. And there probably weren't a lot of efforts to get them to come back. Uh, fighting had left New England largely at that point. Uh, prisoners were unlikely to try to find their regiments. They were unlikely to try to return to Great Britain. And many of them ended up working on short staff farms. They just kind of fit in, kind of filtered themselves into American society. Now among those prisoners of war were Sergeant Buchanan and Private Brooks. They were apparently making their way along the post road that we talked about earlier on their way to Springfield 
to find work. And when they passed the Spooner House in Brookfield in February of 1778, Joshua and Ezra were away at Princeton, and Bathsheba's servant named Alexander Cummings, uh, either on her general directive to ensnare passing soldiers, or, or maybe on her specific orders to grab these two, called them inside. Now, just, just to show you what a small North America was then, Cummings had been a Scottish soldier with Burgoyne, and he actually knew Buchanan and Canada. Brought them, they brought them into the house. Uh, Buchanan and Brooks warmed themselves by the Spooner kitchen fire, and Bathsheba entertained them lavishly. Food, rum, Buchanan would later say that they, quote, were never in better quarters, little thinking of the bait, the seducer of souls, was laying for us. The weather was harsh. Uh, Bathsheba suggested that the two stay on in the house until the weather cleared. Uh, within a day or so, didn't take her long, she told at least Buchanan that her relations with her husband who was away at Princeton, were not good. And through the snows, which came frequently, days after days, the soldiers stayed on at the Spooner house. Uh, Bathsheba apparently enticed Buchanan with the prospect of even warmer hospitality if Joshua, should he return home, were not around at all. Probably should wink again here, but I'm kind of tired. <laughs> In the meantime, Bathsheba had written to Ezra, and he now returned to the Spooner home on February 28th. Joshua was back in the house. The following night, March 1st, Joshua went to a place called Cooley's Tavern, which is about a quarter of a mile, or was about a quarter of a mile from the house. He left the tavern before 9 p.m., walked home, and uh, in the kitchen of the Spooner house, the three soldiers, or ex-soldiers, Buchanan, Brooks, and Ross, had been drinking Flip. Uh, there were a lot of recipes for Flip. I suggest you uh, look that up, especially for Christmas time. It's beer, essentially it's beer, rum, and sugar. And uh, what they used to do was, a lot of the taverns in the 18th century would have an iron right by the fireplace, and you would heat that iron up and you'd stick it into the Flip. I don't know why, it just seems like a cool thing to do. <laughs> Anyway, they were drinking it. Who knows where they were, they were heating it up? I don't know. They were drinking rum, and they were waiting for Joshua to return home. And Sheba was there, too. And at some point, Brooks crouched outside the house near the kitchen door, which was around the right rear. And just about the time Joshua was about to reach the kitchen door, uh, Brooks jumped up, knocked him to the ground, and began to beat him with his fists. And uh, Joshua tried to cry out. Brooks began choking him. Buchanan and Ezra joined in. Ezra removed his watch, handed it to Buchanan. And then Brooks and Ezra tipped Joshua into the well as Buchanan pulled off his shoes. The uh, question is, when Joshua fell headlong into the well, was he already dead? Was he unconscious at least most of the so. The three murderers now came back into the kitchen. Bathsheba was what was later described as vastly confused. Uh, but she was not so confused but that she went upstairs, she returned to the kitchen with a money box. Buchanan broke it open. Paper money was passed around, more than a thousand dollars. And Joshua's clothes were distributed to the murderers. At that point, Buchanan, Brooks, and Ross took off for Worcester. 
Now in the morning, it became known fairly soon that Joshua had not returned home the previous evening. So the search began. And that didn't take long either because there were footprints in the snow in the yard uh, that led right to the well. Uh, and there was blood on the curb of the well that was a little short wall. In the well. Joshua's body was found. Uh, his body was carried into the house. And only his 10-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, would look at it. The following day, a coroner's inquest met at the house. And at that time, uh, Bathsheba touched Joshua's forehead and said, Poor little man. Uh, I've, I've never seen this written anywhere, but I've always thought that was kind of a voluntary exercise of a time-honored practice called murder will out, uh, or called uh, the beer law, other terms. And what it means is, and this really came from the Middle Ages, is if somebody was murdered, uh, you would parade people either by that corpse or have them touch the corpse. And if they began to bleed afresh, there was your murderer. And that practice uh, really died out by the 19th century, except the last known occasion of it happening was in Osterville. <laughs> of all places. <laughs> anyway, the coroner's jury concluded that Joshua had been feloniously assaulted by one or more ruffians then thrown into his own well with water in it. Now, meantime, the three soldiers were in Worcester, and they repaired to Mrs. Walker's tavern. Uh, they drank, they talked, they showed off Joshua's clothes and his valuables, including his monogrammed silver shoe buckles. Uh, these were not master criminals. Uh, there was a quick arrest. They immediately implicated Ezra. They immediately implicated Bathsheba. And in fact, Ezra was found in that same uh, house in the attic. And when he was located up there, he just came apart and immediately started to ask for a minister. So the confessions of these three murderers followed their arrest very quickly. Uh, besides relating in some detail what had happened, uh, and thereby illustrating the defendants, and I love this phrase, scarlet and crimson guilt. Uh, that could have been an alternative title for this talk, but Seducer of Souls was a little bit better, I thought. Uh, but maybe Tommy James and Shondell's their confessions also featured such language as, we have forfeited our lives into the hands of public justice and exposed ourselves to have our parts in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Supposedly somebody said that, who knows. The defendants were indicted in uh, April, actually April 21st, and the trial was set in three days. The three men were charged with murder. Bathsheba was charged with being an accessory or an accomplice before the fact. And we talked before about Blackstone's commentaries on the law of England. Uh, Blackstone went on at some length about this crime, that is being an accessory or, or an accomplice. Uh, but the gist that's pertinent here is a person is charged as an accessory after the fact uh, is not an actor in the offense and not present at its performance, but is someone who procured, counseled, or commanded someone else to commit the crime. Uh, that really seems to fit perfectly with Bathsheba's role here in this crime. Uh, this offense later evolved into the theory of culpability called joint venture. And as you probably know, that was converted here in Massachusetts in 2009 by the Zanetti case to aiding and abetting. 
All of this occurred again in the Revolutionary War. The Patriots, during that period of time, obviously were, of course, traitors to Great Britain. Bathsheba had participated in what English common law still considered petty treason. There were three acts that could be petty treason. And the first was killing of a husband by a wife. It was an aggravated murder distinguished because someone in a subordinate position betrayed her superior. Uh, but she was not charged with that crime. So the quick trial that followed the indictments started at 8 o'clock on April 24th. The evidence ended at midnight. Uh, some 24 witnesses testified, even though the defendants had already confessed. The prosecutor was Robert Treat Payne. He was a delegate to the Continental Congress two years before. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and he was one of the prosecutors of the Boston Massacre defendants back in 1770. Uh, anybody here from Taunton? Better chance of having people from Hardwick at that. If you drive, if you drive into Taunton, there's a statue right in the green that you drive in. Like if you're driving in there to get a chopped suey sandwich, you're going to uh, see this statue when you drive in, and that's Robert Sheep. The defense was chopped suey sandwich. Okay. Uh, the defense was uh, conducted by a guy named Levi Lincoln. Uh, he represented all four of these defendants. And he noted that this was the first capital trial since the establishment of the United States government. Uh, he went on to become Jefferson's, President Jefferson's Attorney General of the United States. But since he represented all four of these defendants, there's an obvious conflict of interest, uh, which really hobbled his ability to represent any one defendant effectively. Uh, but he did try to minimize Ezra's involvement and more powerfully argue that Bathsheba uh, clearly had a disordered mind. Uh, not quite an insanity defense, but edging along toward it. And that was shown by the lack of plan for the crime, kind of an understatement, uh, the lack of a coherent story, and any consideration of her escaping. She didn't go anywhere. She stayed in the house. Uh, and why would she, and I love this word, orphanize her children? And why would she give the murderers, her well-known husbands, clothing? And why wouldn't she just leave Joshua to go to her father, quote, whose favorite she was, or to one of her brothers still in the area. Uh, and then, I guess he defended Ezra, but then he kind of took a slap at him by saying, uh, if she had abandoned her husband, quote, with her address and engaging appearance, she might have had any gallant she pleased, not as Ross. So he probably didn't appreciate that one. Uh, these arguments didn't work. Uh, the, ju the jury, uh, which was a bunch of white guys, uh, returned in the morning and they were all convicted. Everybody was guilty. Um, by the way, does anybody know when in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts the women first sat on a jury of any kind? Anybody know that or care to guess? 19. 51. That was by a statute passed the previous year. Convicted, all four defendants sentenced to hang. Now, the 57-year-old Reverend Thaddeus McCarty had been visiting the prisoners, and Bathsheba apparently confessed to him her guilt and also told him that she was pregnant. 
Now the common law provided at this time that the life of a fetus that had quickened, uh, and I'm given to understand that uh, that really meant a woman's being able to feel or perceive fetal movement. Uh, usually for a woman who's had children, 15, 17 weeks. That's what I'm going to say anyway. And it was known as pleading your belly. A woman who was claiming she was pregnant was pleading her belly. And uh, McCarty was, with this information, able to secure a month's delay of the executions. The court appointed a special jury of two male midwives and 12 matrons. Now, I said before that women would sit on juries. This isn't really a jury, but that's what they called it. Uh, they examined Bathsheba on June 11th and concluded she was not quick with the child. Uh, McCarty had been very convinced by Bathsheba that she was in fact pregnant, and he urged a second examination. And this one was carried out on June 27th. This time, uh, six midwives, three of them women. Four of those six thought she was pregnant. Two women did not. The governor's council refused a further stay of execution. The execution was set for July 2nd. And the final execution warrant was signed by a, a deputy secretary named John Avery Jr. Mr. Avery might have been a little prejudiced uh, against Bathsheba. He was a member of what was called the Loyal Nine. This was the inner circle of the Sons of Liberty in Boston, so deeply revolutionary. Uh, and those people obviously loathed Timothy Ruggles. So maybe a little bit prejudice. Uh oh, also, he was Joshua's stepbrother, someone who had signed a bond of guardianship for Joshua and Bathsheba's children. Now, the hanging was going to be in Worcester. Uh, there was a crowd. Uh, spectators expected. These hangings were, of course, public. Uh, and indeed, it was sort of a public entertainment, enlightenment. Uh, there were refreshment booths, toys for the kids, uh, hawkers selling broadsides. And sort of pertinent to our own day, Worcester selectmen warned people recently recovered from smallpox and their caregivers to stay away unless they had been sufficiently cleansed. Not sure how that was accomplished or determined. So I second rolled around. Uh, McCarty delivered a noon sermon. Only lasted a couple of hours since the hanging was scheduled for 2.30. Uh, the three male defendants were, were there. Uh, Bathsheba was not there. She was reportedly weak after the examinations she had undergone. Uh, back at the jail, McCarty found Bathsheba calm and humble and penitent. He baptized her. And then the procession began down what is now Summer Street in Worcester. Uh, the undertaker's wagon with four coffins. First, uh, the three defendants on foot. Uh, Sheba was in a carriage with the Reverend McCarty. They were all surrounded by a hundred men deputized as a guard, shouting, make way, make way. Horses there too, and some of the crowd, which was estimated to be about 5,000, uh, which was considerably more than the population of Worcester, uh, were trampled, screaming by these uh, horses. And then, just right on cue, the sky darkened, there was a violent thunderstorm described as an awful half hour, a dreadful compound scene of horror. Things calmed down a little bit in terms of the weather. Uh, three men ascended the, gall the gallows. 
Bathsheba waited in a carriage, uh, and then she joined them, reportedly creeping up the steps. Uh, though she was dressed stylish by all counts, the one rumor had it that she was wearing her wedding gown, which is a nice touch, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> and she was, though, wearing an ostrich plume hat. Uh, she took the sheriff's hand and said, My dear sir, I am ready. In a little time, I expect to be in bliss. And but a few years must elapse when I hope I shall see you and my other friends again. Uh, more probably she didn't say anything. Uh, and then the trap dropped. The four defendants were, as the expression then went, turned off. Uh, now I say the trap dropped. Uh, the trap dropped. Uh, there was a gallows built tall enough for the benefit of the spectators. And there was a trap. But the method of hanging, known as the long drop, which was the method that, uh, by which the intent was that the hanged person would fall a calculated height so as not to break, uh, so as to break their necks, uh, did not evolve until at least the 1850s. Um, that always didn't go very well either, the long drop, but that's a talk for another time when you're not eating. Uh, and how these four died was certainly by the short drop. And when you are hanged by the short drop, you are strangled. Uh, death usually takes between 10 and 20 minutes. And that's the reason for the sentence phrase that you hear, Hang by the neck until you are dead. And it's also why the condemned's legs were usually uh, bound at the thigh and ankle to minimize kicking. Uh, but the hope was that unconsciousness could occur within about 6 to 15 seconds, which, under the circumstances, is still a pretty long time. That having been accomplished, there was some kind of an examination of Bathsheba's body. She was carrying a five-month male fetus. Now, the preeminent women's uh, right figure, uh, the suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in 1899, wrote a newspaper article in New York hoping to convince New York Governor Teddy Roosevelt to forestall a certain woman's execution. Uh, Stanton argued that given Bathsheba's pregnancy, hanging her was a mistake, and, and it was illegal. And as a result, no woman had been hanged in Massachusetts since. Wrong. Uh, two, perhaps three, were hanged after Bathsheba, though fairly soon thereafter. Uh, Eleven years after Bathsheba was hanged, uh, the last woman hanged, executed in Massachusetts by that means, was the career criminal, maybe pirate, Rachel Wall. And she was hanged on Boston Common in 1789, prosecuted by Robert Tree Payne. It's unsure, or it's unknown for sure, where the convicted defendants were buried. For a while, it was known that Bathsheba was buried in what is now Green Park in Worcester, and her gravesite had been marked by a stone and a fence. Uh, but apparently, when she became uh, sort of well known again as a result of the Elizabeth Cady Stanton article, uh, visitors to her gravesite became numerous. So the groundskeeper right around the turn of the 20th century, obscured the location of her grave. By whose authority, who knows. Uh, Ezra is probably buried in a plot of 100 nameless dead in Linebrook, Ipswich. Buchanan, Brooks, who knows. 
Joshua is buried right near the front wall of the Brookfield Cemetery on East Main Street. Uh, he is buried next to Bathsheba's sister and her husband. Names were Tufts. But Joshua's stone dates from some 50 years after his murder in 1778. Who arranged for that or it remains a mystery. The stone is a little difficult to read, but it says, Joshua Spooner, murdered March 1st, 1778, by three soldiers of the Revolution, Ross, Brooks, and Buchanan, at the instigation of his wife, Bathsheba. They were all executed at Worcester, July 2nd, 1778. Now, the picture of Bathsheba that I, that I would have shown you when we ever have slides is a, a full-length portrait. It's an imagined uh, a, a picture of Bathsheba. And highly allegorical. She's standing there looking very defiant with her arms crossed, I think. There's a black cat in the picture. There's a crow. Uh, there's a moose hanging out of a tree. And in the background are the three soldiers murdering Joshua by throwing him into the well. And her face, she looks like a, a movie starlet from the 70s, the 1970s, which is when this painting was created. And it's in the Worcester Law Library. It's fantastic. And the best part is there is a description written, pasted on the wall next to the painting. And in part it reads, Bathsheba's story is a triumph of heart and spirit that endures to this day. The yeah. end. <laughs> Questions? Do we have... Was that anticipated or either way? Anybody have any questions? Easy ones? Don't have to be about this, eh, Trudia? Yes. Is there a nickname for Bathsheba? I think it's Bathsheba. Which is not all that much shorter. Maybe, what a good one might be Batty? I don't know. I'm not just curtain. Anybody else? Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.